this is more for developers in the room. I don't know. Uh, raise your hands. Christina, our main dev. Uh, <laughs> our core dev, Christina. Um, just showing a few like basic comments that we do with Ocean. And of course, you can use this in JavaScript, and you can use this in Python, which are JavaScript is a language you would use in the browser. Python is something a data scientist would use. Um, but they would all boil down to the basic commands, uh, the basic interface, command line tools. And the first thing I, I had to do is I had to start, um, let's see, let me clean this up a bit. Um, I had to start a lot of ocean services with this one single comment that I got from, uh, from our GitHub, I would say start ocean. And when I press start ocean, it starts all these components that Troy just showed us. Uh, this Brizo access control, this IKEA catalog, which is called Aquarius, uh, this Ethereum node, which runs the smart contracts, and then something called the secret store, which stores secrets. Um, so that, with one single comment, you, if you're a developer, you press that in and then you get a lot of mumbo jumbo here, and that means that it probably is all good. So what we did was, well, we want to make this um, quite versatile to use. So we're not targeting a specific language, saying that it's only JavaScript, it's only Python, uh, because it has to go into a lot of environments. So we chose to create a command line interface, which is a very generic approach. And you can build APIs on top of that. You can build middleware and other type of things on top of that. So we, this little tool that we have, we call it tuna because tuna eats fish. Uh, and with this, I can, for example, look at the accounts that I have. And this shows me Ethereum accounts. So these are all Ethereum accounts and they have this Ethereum address. And this is basically where my money is stored. These are my wallets. If somebody knows a private key to this, it, they can hack it and they can go run away with my Ethereum. And six months ago, that would have been a good move. Right. <laughs> so I can also look at what's my actual balance. Um, so what I would do then is I would take, I'm just copy pasting some comments here, uh, but I could just type in what's my balance of my account. Now you would see that I have a tremendous amount of ether, and I don't, don't know what I'm doing here with this amount of ether. I could be but on the beach. Only, but only 474 ocean? Yeah, that's conversion ratio. 474 Excellent. ocean is Excellent. that amount of ether. So just want to say to all our investors, great move. <laughs> now, I don't think, indeed, I don't think I have enough ocean tokens so what i can do is i can request more tokens and this is something we would use in a faucet if you are a developer and basically we're working with these tokens and these wallets and you start up out with an empty wallet how do you do that well you just ask the ocean team like hey can we have some tokens and you do that by pressing a command so let's say i want to have 666 tokens ocean tokens so now you can see my ocean balance is 474. I'm requesting the tokens and I wait. And when Bruce says, okay, okay, thank you, Bruce. Now I receive 666 tokens. Um, so again, I could check, did I actually receive those tokens? So I can go back and check my balance. And indeed, I have more ocean tokens now. So, and if I make the sum, then it's probably right. Perfect. Um, another thing that's fun is, is our secret store. The secret store is, think of this as a private messaging app. Think of it like Signal or maybe Telegram, but then a bit better. On a fully decentralized le ledger with a lot of nodes in the system. Let's say we have 10 nodes. And each node of the system is going to store a little piece of my personal information encrypted. And they cannot do with any of my information unless all those nodes collaborate and they 
then they're actually able to decipher the text. So what I can do, and this sounds a bit uh, interesting, is for example, I can store a secret into this magical vault, magical data vault out there, and nobody can read my secrets until I give them the decryption key. So what I do here is I'm using the secret store to encrypt a message which says much secret wow uh, happy to have you on the ocean meetup for example so what it does now it basically gives me some information of how the network stored my information now I could say, well, I, if I give this information to somebody else, with, together with a secret key that I stored somewhere, I could allow them to decrypt this. So then I have to just press the decryption command. And in a bit, I'll tell you why this is interesting. Oh, let me do the following. I'm just going to store this into a file. Oh, a file that I'll remove. So if I go and look into the file, you'll see the same information. But now I can basically say, I'm going to restore that information. I cannot decrypt it out of this magical cloud that stores our information. And I have this same secret. Now, why is this important? This means that this is a mechanism to if I have secrets to share, for example, access tokens towards my cloud services, and I need to communicate that to the publishers and the consumers and all the people, but only when I want it. So this is a mechanism. Think of it as a cloud secret store and that allows us to drop all this sensitive information, and we're pretty sure that it can never be hacked unless the entire network starts colliding Question. Sorry to interrupt you. What's the difference uh, if you use just peer-to-peer, uh, peer? uh, PGP, or yeah. just a PPI structure? So having just an asymmetric. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, that's a that's a very that's an approach we were we were thinking of, uh, but that requires us to create a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So that means that I need to know where I can drop that information towards oh. you. Oh, uh, so in the, in the asymmetric key, you're, there has, everybody has this private key for, for decrypting mm -hmm. information, yeah, and the public key is published. It's public, so there's two challenges. Yep. So public key is public, possible private is private. Key. Exactly. Okay, so okay, now I have a it message. Doesn't need a, it, a, it doesn't need a peer to peer communication. Well, you can post uh, this information somewhere. Where? Somewhere. That's somewhere. A, that's a question we need to solve, and that somewhere is a secret store. Okay. It's an other other layer. It's basically saying that this is our inbox. This is our right, right. regular inbox, but it, it has additional levels of security, and one of them is that the one that you just mentioned. Right. So, so it's that, and then why can pass it just you can post this the the encrypted well, information uh, just uh, just on a maybe just on a web space or whatever. We could, but yeah. we thought that IPFS. you could do it on IPFS as well. Yeah. So I mean, what is the advantage? This has high guarantees of security and availability. Uh, because of what? Because it, it uses multiple. Uh, it, it uses something called Shamir's secret sharing. So it basically shreds up the, the keys and it disperses it on a decentralized network where you need to have a threshold of decryptors to uh, make sure that the network can decode it. So you don't have one party that can collide. So it also gives you a lot of availability, saying that those nodes will always be in the network because Ethereum is just there. Uh, and additionally, and that's quite important, is we can connect the secret store to our smart contracts, to those service agreements. So they basically can do additional validation. Is this person actually eligible to decrypt that information based on the information in the smart contract? So that gives us an additional hook of validation. So what I'm saying here is that it's, what you're saying is correct, but it wouldn't give us the additional capabilities to hook into the smart contract layer to give that availability and that level of sharded security. So you have a different feature, another feature. Here. Yeah, it's it's basically, yeah, yeah, it's basically um, the same, but with a lot of 
um, very interesting capabilities attached to it. It's very nice to, to work with. Um, so yeah, that's, and, and interestingly, like for an end user, it's not much more than just using encrypt and decrypt. And it will do all those checks on the smart contract. If you're not allowed in the smart, let's say we use a, if we don't have a service agreement between us, then that decryption network will not allow you to see my secret uh, session keys or something like that. So based on the content of a smart contract or the state of a smart contract of those service agreements, we can additionally validate who can decrypt or not decrypt. And one more interesting feature, we can also have a proof from the network that somebody actually did the decryption, which you cannot have in public-private key uh, exchange. So this gives us a proof of somebody actually decrypted the session key. So we know already one more provenance event in our system. Um, I'll just show you a few more comments. Um, one of them is, um, let's say we want to use that IKEA catalog. Uh, then we have to register an asset. I have, um, let me first, we, those assets, those services or, or data assets, they kind of look a bit, you could say, boring. Um, but all of this, for example, if you use that, um, that graphical interface that, uh, that Troy showed, like this web page you have, it would, what, what spits it out is just you click on it, you, you fill in a few things, and it spits out this JSON file which is basically how our catalog is indexed. This is what we call our metadata store. Um, if we have that, we can, uh, we have this JSON and we can just upload it to the metadata store. And what it comes back is an identifier. This identifier, it's called a decentralized identifier. It's used, uh, decentralized identifiers are used for decentralized identity projects mostly. So this says that every identity, albeit governmental, non-governmental, a machine or whatnot, should have an identity. And those identifiers look a bit cryptographic, uh, but yeah, that's what it is. So th the cool thing about these things is they're compatible with a lot of decentralized other systems like Sovereign, Uport, um, what have you, uh, Yolocom here, uh, you have a few others like Microsoft working on some, and they use, all use the same type of format of identifier. So this means that your IKEA catalog could be actually an identity catalog somewhere. So you don't really have to spin up your own IKEA catalogs, you can just use existing ones. So once I have this identifier, um, I can, for example, let's say I wanna check I want to search and query. This is something that if I'm a consumer, I'd love to do. Um, I want to search for weather information, and then it will give me a list of files that contain the keyword weather. So this is something that you would use in a marketplace saying that, hey, I'm a data scientist. I'm looking for interesting, uh, what was it again? Almond data. You would put, let's see if I have almond data. Actually, I don't think I have almond data. Unfortunately, uh, Troy, we have no, no almond data yet. Um, but this would be your typical s Google search from the command line, and, and that would be it. So that's as far as I can currently show the demo. We're, we're working, the rest of the, the mechanics are better viewed throughout uh, the browser. Uh, I think Jerry can do that in a follow-up, or we will definitely do that in the tutorial and publish this online as well. Um, yeah, so it's at the lowest level, it's quite low level, but I think it's, it's, it's just a few comments that you have to, the API is very short. Uh, Ocean Protocol might be a complex system, but we try to make it very concise. You only have like five to 10 comments. That's all you have. That's all you need to publish, consume, register, search, and encrypt, decrypt. And with that, you can basically create marketplaces or data pipelines, publish assets, search assets, and do all these things. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. I think this demo now looks a bit rough, and that's cool because in the next iteration, you'll see more and more of this functionality coming to a glorious 
uh, and Thrizzle. Yeah, exactly. So if you're interested, all of these things are on GitHub. Uh, I hope they're or on the docs.oceanprotocol.com. You'll find a lot of information there as well. So if you kind of feel like, oh, I want to try it out, I want to play with a few of these concepts, um, you're free to do so. We have no proprietary information. So yeah, I guess that's for now. We'll have a beer and 